because we are effectively entered a new era with the latest scientific developments, a new era where, uh, uh, as we all know, humanity, maybe for the first time in history, has the ability to, to perturb, disturb the entire natural cycle of life on Earth and in this sense to, to destroy, uh, in this sense to destroy itself. And what's the problem here? A lot could be said about how ideology is crucial. Sorry? Yeah, no, what I want to say is that, look, the Copenhagen talks, which as we know, failed. I think uh, a Copenhagen talk in, the, in December about uh, uh, how to face ecological threat. Compare Copenhagen talks to reaction to financial crisis one year ago. Although we know it's our survival at stake, in Copenhagen they were dealing, negotiating, we have time, not 50, 40 billion dollars and so on. You remember how when the financial crisis broke out, in one week they found first 750, then more and so on and so on. And something very interesting happened there. You remember, Bush was still president. First, Bush went to Congress demanding that the Congress votes for the money. Congress first said no, American Congress. Then the entire American elite came together, Bush, Obama, all of them, and basically their message to the Congress was, don't play games. This is now no time for democratic debate, we need this money. In one week, the Congress, so this is a big lesson of how capitalism functions. We can, we can debate about everything, ecology, hunger, age, and so on, when? It comes to financial capital, money, there is no joke. You simply have to do it there. So uh, my point here is that uh, the lesson of the Copenhagen fiasco is that neither private capital nor state will do it. This is for me the very sad lesson of Copenhagen, that we need some kind of, I don't know how will it look, communist mobilization. By communist, I mean something very uh, precise. I mean, I refer here to a wonderful distinction. Before you were talking, I heard about private public by, you know, the German philosopher, one of the biggest, Immanuel Kant. He opposes in a very interesting way, which is more than ever actual today, public and private use of reason. For him, private is not when you sit with, with your friends in the kitchen. Private is precisely state apparatus and so on. Private is when the debate is subordinated to some corporate community goals, so that you know in advance we serve the state, we don't criticize the state, and so on and so on. For Kant, public use of reason is a more radical, universal one, where you are no longer bound by narrow. So we need that kind of a public use of reason, which means uh, that, uh, which uh, means that another thing, that uh, there is tremendous lot of work to be done here. Ecology is a problem, but as you, especially in India, must know, it's also one of the main fields of ideological struggle, of ideological investment today. It is used to punish you, countries in development, like uh, don't develop and so on. It is used as a source of new obscurantist ideologies and so on and so on. And my solution here, again, to provoke you is a radical one. The only truly radical ecology is the ecology which claims nature doesn't exist. Don't be afraid. Not in the sense of a stupid subjectivism, like, you know, I just invent nature. In the sense that what is usually in ecologist ideology meant by nature, a kind of a mother nature, you know, big living homeostatic system which we humans disturbed with our bad, uh, evil technological exploitation. Nature is crazy in herself. If it's a mother, it's a pretty crazy mother. I mean, just think about oil. Are we even able to imagine what kind of a mega catastrophe ecological must have happened for us to have oil, reserves of oil? So the message is not don't take ecology seriously. The message, I think, it's an even harsher one. Uh, 
there is no natural balance to which we can return. It's an open, risky process. So first, ecology. Second field where I see insoluble problems, the inappropriateness of the institution of private property for the so-called intellectual labor. As you probably know, the, these new digital industries and so now fight again and again with the problem how to keep the results of intellectual work in the form of private property. If there is one good thing about intellectual work, which produces knowledge, expertise, is that in contrast to material products, it multiplies by use. If I have a car and you buy it from me, if we both use the car, it gets used faster. If I produce or you a piece of knowledge, the more we use it, the richer it becomes. It's, the logic is already in itself much more uh, communist. So what I'm saying is that this is why more and more today we are dealing with state regulation and so on and so on, or with all these absurd consequences where you also in India were victims. Wasn't there a case, everyone was shocked, when uh, a method for healing or whatever used for hundreds of years by your farmers was patentized in the United States and all of a sudden your farmers learned that they had to pay for what they were doing for hundreds of years and so on and so on. So again, I claim that uh, intellectual, so-called intellectual property, it will get more and more crazy. If we leave free path to it, we will live in a totally crazy situation where even our thoughts and so on will be owned by others. The third domain, don't underestimate it, is are the socio-ethical implications of the new techno-scientific developments, biogenetics and so on and so on. It's interesting to know that Fukuyama himself, who is not a total idiot, admitted, I met him at some debate recently, that the very fact of biogenetics changes his diagnostic. Now he admits. No, no, uh, uh, no end of history. Why? Because uh, something is so radical is potentially happening, which I think will change maybe even our very elementary definition of what it is to be human. I refer here not only to the fact that in predictable future, it will be already possible to, through genetic manipulations, change not only our physical properties of newborn children or even adults, but especially psychological properties and attitudes. For example, my friends in China gave me, gave me a kind of a big plan of Chinese Academy of Sciences for, and they are pretty open there. They claim that their goal is, to cut a long story short, to control the entire Chinese population, its physical and mental health. You know, like to genetically in the long term reduce aggressivity if needed or whatever.